In this video, we're going to show you how to successfully set up Shimano hydraulic disc brakes. In this video, we're going to be using 105 level components. But if your road bike has Ortegra or Dura Ace, then the steps apply to those as well. For this job, you will need the following tools. Allen keys, a torque wrench, a lock ring tool for your disc brake rotors. This will either be a hollow tech tool such as this or a cassette tool, depending on the lock ring that your rotors have. An eight mil spanner, some nitrile gloves to uh, look after your hands when you're using brake fluid. You'll also need something to cut your hoses. You can use standard cutters, but it doesn't work as well. And we'd highly recommend you use a specific hose cutting tool such as this, which can also install barbs into the hoses. A routing kit, if you've got internal cables on your bike, some electrical tape and bar tape to go on the bars. And then we also have some optional tools which are required if you're going to be bleeding your brakes. This isn't always necessary, but if you have to cut your hoses to length, you will need to re-bleed them. In which case, you'll also require a bleed kit, Shimano hydraulic mineral oil, and also a seven mil spanner. The first step is to make sure that your frame is ready and prepared to install the components. Now, if you're buying a brand new frame and you're going to be fitting bits to it, then they usually come with cables pre-installed and ready on the frame. This makes life a lot easier. If your frame doesn't have this, or perhaps you're installing on an older frame, then you'll need to route the cables through the frame and get them ready in this step. If you've got a heavily integrated frame with internal routing, then a routing kit is invaluable uh, for this process, especially seeing as many modern bikes now have lots of integration. One thing to bear in mind is that when you do install cables and hoses, don't cut them to length yet. Get them and keep them nice and long, and that way you can then cut them to length when you install the parts um, as things will alter, such as if you change the width of your bars and things like that. On this frame, we have the liners uh, installed, but we still need to fit cables and hoses. So I'm gonna do that now and then fit the bars and stem. So you can take your routing kit and apply this end into the cable liner. Be careful with it as it can still pull out, but then we're gonna use this from the other end to pull gently and pull the cable through the frame. Now going to install the hydraulic line to the rear brake. This routes through the down tube and then through the chainstay on the non-drive side. Also over the hose, we're going to put this foam liner. Now this is important because it stops the cable from rattling on the inside of the frame. It dampens the noise so that you don't get annoying rattles as you ride along. Take the routing kit and put that into the hose. And using this, we can pull the hose through the frame. Performing this task can often be much easier with the bottom bracket of the bike removed, as by removing the bottom bracket, you can then usually get your fingers in there and help manipulate the cables just to work them past this area into the various parts. This also goes for the gear cables on the drive side as well. For the hydraulic routing in the fork, it's also internal, but here we don't have a liner. So we're gonna take the fork out as I've done here and just do it on the bench. It's much easier to work with this way. You'll see that the cable threads through the fork blade internally here, comes out of the steerer through that slot, then roots up through the head tube and comes out of the top of the headset here. Once again, a routing kit can make this job much easier. Simply thread the magneted end of the routing kit through the fork, and then you can then collect it at the other end with another magnet. Then simply repeat the process like we did for the rear hose, uh, which is to then thread the routing kit into the hose for the front brake, 
and then you'll be able to pull it simply through the integrated fork. Dead easy. Without a headset or stem in place, it can be useful to put a strap or something to secure the fork to the frame while you work on the bike. Many frames these days have internally routed cables and increased levels of integration. This can make fitting a new group set a little bit trickier than when cables used to be exposed. So on a frame such as this, we have the cable for the rear derailleur, which routes from the back of the frame through the chainstay and up through the down tube and then through the steerer. So to route it, a routing kit is invaluable. As you can see, I'm now installing the Orbea specific spacers onto the steerer tube and where the cables route either internally or externally will depend on your specific model of bike. So refer to the instructions. Now when tightening the headset and stem bolts, I would always recommend using a torque wrench. This is to avoid damaging components and also ensuring safe assembly. Because I don't have the wheel in the bike, when it's in the stand like this, you can't really set up the headset properly. So what I'm doing is simply nipping up the uh, headset top cap and the stem bolts so that it's now secure and doesn't fall through the frame. But once I've sorted out uh, the, the brakes and gears and fitted those, I will then put the bike on the ground with a wheel in the frame and make sure that the headset is set up properly later. Now I'm going to install the brake calipers onto the frame. Now the brake calipers themselves are identical. It doesn't matter if you use uh, either one for front or rear. But what is different is the mounting plates on the calipers themselves. So the front mounting plate has two options. You can install it one way and it's designed for 160 rotors or you can flip it, bolt it onto the caliper and then it's designed for 140 rotors. The plate adjusts the position of the caliper so that it is right depending on the diameter rotor you're using. On the rear caliper, if you mount it without the plate, then it's set up for 140s. This is the standard for direct mount calipers. But then by adding in this wedge plate here, it then brings it up to a 160 rotor. Our bike has a 160 rotor for the rear brake, so we've got the wedge plate installed on the caliper. Before mounting the calipers, you should fit the barb and the olive to the hose and then fit the hose into the caliper before bolting it onto the frame. Now to fit the barb, you should use a barb tool and make sure that you have the correct size barb. This can differ slightly from different setups. These are Shimano HB90 hoses and so they use this particular barb. To install the barb, take the barb and place it into the end of the hose. It's tapered so it should just slot slightly in place like so. Then take the barb tool, open it up so that the cable can slot into place. Push the hose all the way through until the end of the barb tool is securing the end of the barb like so. Tighten the cable, it needs to be fairly secure so that the cable won't move when you push the barb into the hose. Repeat the same process for the front hose as well. The hose fixing nut is tightened into the caliper like this, and then the olive sits in between. The olive is tapered so that it fits in that gap there, and then what happens is, is as you tighten the nut with your eight mil spanner, it crushes the olive inside and creates a seal. Mm -hmm. 
Next, we're gonna bolt the calipers to the frame. There is a standard length Shimano bolt that comes with calipers. However, some frames do have a slightly different design here, in which case they usually supply special length bolts if they're required. With the caliper now secured onto the frame, you can install the little safety fixing pin onto the rear bolt. Simply repeat for the front brake once again. At this point, if you're using a bar with externally routed cables like this, I'd recommend putting some black electrical tape to hold the cables in place so that you can make sure that they're the right length, you can size them up and put your shifters on. You may need to tweak the position of the cables a bit later on, but it's just useful to keep them held in place. I'm now going to put the shifters onto the bar, but this isn't permanent. What I'm actually doing is going to put them on the bar and position them how I want them so that I can measure the cables and make sure the cables are the correct length and then cut the cables. I'm then going to take the shifters off and then with the shifters off secure the cables into the shifters before putting them back on in place. The reason for this is it's much easier to work on the shifters and get the cables installed with them sort of hanging where you want them and you can manipulate them in your hands rather than having it fixed on the bar. Another tip as well is when you do this is I would level off the bike in the stand as that way it's much easier to see if you've got the shifter level and where you want it in position. Don't worry too much about getting it in the exact position you want it as you can do micro adjustments and tweak it. You can also pull a little bit of cable through the frame if you do require it. You'll notice that some handlebars have graduations on the drops that you can use to help position the shifters and make sure that they're consistent both on left and right. With the levers roughly in position, you then want to get the hoses and just push them a bit back into the frame. This will give you a bit of slack and a bit of cable to play with if you need it. It's also good flexibility to have because later if you were to change your bars and go for wider handlebars, having that little bit of extra length will mean that's possible without completely changing the cables. As with the calipers, we repeat the process of putting a barb in the end of the hose, then the hose retaining nut and an olive, and then that's then fitted into the shifter. Now to do this, you have to be very careful not to over tighten it, as it can damage the shifter. So to do that, I'm actually using a crow foot adapter and a torque wrench pay attention to the five to six newton meters on the shifter. You can use a standard spanner, but I'm just being extra careful. With the hose fitted into the shifter, we can then replace the shifter back onto the handlebars and repeat the process for the other shifter as well. The next step is to bleed the brakes so that the hydraulic fluid is in there and they're working properly. The first step involves getting the bleed block and putting that inside the caliper. Just to be clear, in order to insert the bleed block, you'll need to remove the brake pads from the caliper if they're not already removed. You'll then take the pin that would normally hold the pads and use that just to secure the bleed block in place and tighten the bleed block pin with the flathead screwdriver. It doesn't need to be very tight, just to hold it in place. We're then gonna peel the top of the shifter hood back in order to gain access to the bleed port, which we will undo with a two and a half mil Allen key. It's 
it's a good idea to place some blue roll or a rag just around the shifter like so, as this helps protect the shifter from the brake fluid getting on to the rubber housing as it can damage it. We'll then take the bleed block reservoir and attach that to the top of the shifter into the port. Now in many instances with modern Shimano components you'll require this adapter to be screwed into the bottom of the reservoir. I should also point out that when you start working with the hydraulic fluid you should really put gloves on your hands to protect them. Next fill the syringe with the hydraulic mineral oil. With the syringe filled, attach it to the bleed port. Next, take your seven millimeter spanner and open the bleed port. This usually only requires a couple of half turns. You don't want to fully undo it. With the bleed port open, we're now going to depress the syringe to inject the hydraulic fluid up through the caliper, through the line and into the shifter. You should start to see fluid coming up into the reservoir that we've attached on the top of the shifter. But before you start depressing the syringe, make sure you take out the little plunger in the reservoir. Now when you do this, be careful. Don't ram the syringe home. It can cause things to pop off and leak. So you just want to depress it very gently and carefully push the fluid through. With the system now flushed with the mineral oil, we can close the bleed port. With the port now closed, just pull back on the syringe plunger before you pull off the hose. That way you'll create some backward pressure and it'll mean that you don't have hyd hydraulic fluid spraying everywhere as you, as you pull it off. Now we're going to insert the plunger into the reservoir and remove it. Replace the port with the two and a half mil Allen key. As a note of caution, be careful not to over tighten this and strip out the head. It's about two newton meters max. It's quite easy to do. Make sure to replace the little dust cap off the bleed port as this does stop dirt ingressing into the system. And then the next step is to make sure that there is no hydraulic mineral oil on this as it can contaminate the disc brakes. Once you're satisfied it's cleaned down, you can then start putting in the pads and then installing the wheel and the rotor. If you do have contamination of hydraulic fluid on the system or just some dirt in general, if you're fitting some components that have been previously used, then I recommend using some disc brake cleaner on this area and then wiping it down. So I'm going to remove the bleed block and then put the pads in. With the brake blocks fitted, remember to put on the little safety retaining pin on the end, like that. To install the rotor onto your wheel, make sure you put it on the correct way around. It should only fit one way around, but the writing will be on the outside. You'll then take your lock ring. Now there are two different types. One uses a Holotech uh, fitting and we'll use a spanner like this, the Holotech tool to lock the lock ring in place. The other type uses a cassette tool lock ring similar to what you'd find on a cassette. Simply put that on. It's best to start these off by hand. Uh, if you go straight in with the tool, you can often cross thread them. So loosely do it by hand. 
and then finish it with the tool. With the rotor now fitted on the wheel, before we fit the wheel into the frame, I'm just going to loosen the caliper bolts. This will allow us to center the caliper properly over the rotor to ensure that it's not rubbing. To center the caliper, pull the brake on and hold the lever and then do up the bolts on the caliper. To set up the rear brake, you want to repeat the process that you've done for the front, but with one important distinction. Alter the orientation of the bike in the stand so that, if I undo it here, twist it round, so that the caliper is the lowest point in the system. This is because the bleeding process uses gravity, and if you have, say, the bottom bracket area as the lowest point in the system, this can cause air bubbles to get trapped here. We don't want that. We want all the air bubbles to come out, out the top of the bleed port in the shifter. I hope you found this video useful and it's shown you how to set up your Shimano hydraulic disc brakes. If it has, then please give it a thumbs up as it helps support the channel. And as for setting up the gears and the drivetrain, we've got a separate video which will show you exactly how to do that. Let us know in the comments if there's any other maintenance videos you'd like us to make in the future and I'll see you in the next one.